remember. I'll, I'll, I'll try to speak loudly. My, my name is Chris Paxson, and I'm Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School, and I'd like to welcome all of you back to Graduate Alumni Weekend at our annual colloquium, and it's great to see all of you here. Uh, I, People uh, I've sort of been astounded at how far people come for this. We have people here from, I think, you know, the U.S. as well as five countries, um, six countries, France, Hong Kong, India, Kenya, Madagascar, Peru, U.K., and Vietnam. So people have made, made long trips to anybody, but we usually do recognize people who have come, who have, um, what's the right way to say this, who are in earlier cohorts. <laughs> and <laughs> so, so we have one member from the class of 61, Wayne Anderson. <laughs> Two members from the class of 56, we're doing the reunion years here, Harry Montgomery and Doric Rosansky. Class of 51, so this is a 60th reunion. Giles Kelly and Drew Barrett. And then, although this is not a reunion, you're one person from the class of 1950, Jim Clark. <laughs> so, so, as most of you know, the topic this year, we, we rotate the topics of the colloquium from domestic and international and, and development, different areas. The topic this year is Dollars, Development, and Diplomacy, Rethinking U.S. Foreign Aid and Policy. And so we were really happy to invite uh, uh, Bob Orr to be our keynote speaker tonight. Uh, I think he can give a slightly, a very broad perspective on this topic and really do a great job kicking off the colloquium. Bob received his Ph.D. and his MPA from the Wilson School. His focus was on international relations, but like many of our students, he sort of, you know, straddled IR and development uh, as well. He is an expert on post-conflict reconstruction, the UN, peacekeeping, and the promotion of democracy. And like many of our graduates, his career has really, you know, moved in a variety of directions over time. Uh, he has been in academic institutions. He was the executive director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. Uh, he's been with the federal government, where he's held a number of senior posts. He was deputy uh, to the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. and director of the U.S.-U.N. Washington office. Since 2004, he served as the assistant secretary general for strategic planning and policy coordination at the U.N. So I'm, I'm really happy to have him. I, I spoke to him, we ran into each other at a conference just earlier this week by coincidence, and he was telling me a lot about the new approaches they're taking at the UN. I was very impressed. Um, I would like to take credit for it for the Woodrow Wilson School. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and so please join me in welcoming him. Thank you so very much, Chris. It is uh, a real honor to have been asked to uh, speak with you tonight. And it is wonderful that I can, uh, can do this alongside our, our new dean. Uh, we all, all institutions go through leadership changes. And uh, uh, I was just teasing Chris the other day when I did see her that when I went to school here, she was the the bright young star at the Woodrow Wilson School. She's now the bright young dean at the Woodrow Wilson School. So uh, it's an honor to have been asked to come back and speak with you all tonight. Uh, I was asked to try to kick off this discussion about US uh, foreign assistance, but I'm, I'm going to surround it. I'm going to have a foreign policy sandwich. I'd like to start at home and then talk about the global uh, dimension. And I think it should situate where our US foreign policy may need to go. Um, but I will talk less about the US foreign policy dimension than I will about the US domestic dimension and the, uh, the global <coughs> side of the equation. We are living in extraordinary times. Just the dinner conversation I had tonight uh, jumped from subject to subject, and every single one of them of almost transcendental importance. That's both exciting and terrifying. And when you work where I do, the institution that is 
ultimately the place where countries and governments dump the problems they can't solve. We at the UN end up with the hardest messes on our doorstep every day. Our doorstep is very, very full right now. And I think it's a sign of the times that it's not just the global institutions, but national institutions throughout the world are straining under the burden right now. And that's an economic burden, that's a political burden, that's a security burden. Systems are quivering out there around the world. But I do want to start here in the United States, because I think there are some things going on that set the context for what's happening in the globe that we always assumed, as we studied at this institution, that the United States, and I was thinking about the different classes that uh, Dean Paxson was calling these out, in this entire period where all of us attended this school, the idea that the U.S. was kind of the paramount power was an accepted axiom. And U.S. leadership and what kind of U.S. leadership was always the discussion. I think that's still the case, that U.S. leadership is essential. But there are tectonic shifts going on in the world right now. And so the discussion has to be broader than just U.S. foreign policy. But for the U.S., we have to start at home. Times are very tough. Americans are suffering. Job losses are very real. Oil prices are high. Energy prices are only going to get higher. The U.S. is running the largest deficit in history. And our po politics have fractured to the point where, in a few hours, we are very likely to see a government shutdown. This is sobering indeed. Um, the United States, if it is to play a leadership position, uh, is not exactly playing the strongest hand right now. And I think it's an important departure point because it informs what we have to think about how the U.S. could play a leadership role to put together what we need in the world today. But as I was getting ready for this, I was thinking about my experience at this school. And it was very striking. Yesterday I spent all day on Capitol Hill in an extensive series of meetings. And suffice it to say, with the budget debate going on, is all about shutdown fever. Brinksmanship, a lot of posturing, but a lot of very hard questions that, quite frankly, no one seemed to have the answers to. And this is the smallest of the three challenges facing the country over the budget. This fiscal year budget, which is seven months late, is the smallest potato. The issue of the debt ceiling is a much bigger issue. The issue of the FY12 budget is much bigger yet. If we're going to shut down right now over by far the smallest of the three big budget issues facing our country, we are, in fact, facing a real crisis. But here at the school, I was prepared for this. I know that it's hard to believe, but we really were prepared for the real world at this school. Um, I'm recalling my first year at the school, we had a budget simulation. I had never served in the U.S. federal government. I had no idea how the U.S. federal budget worked. And yet we had a simulation that ran in parallel to our final exams, the first term. And one would have thought, being good students, we would focus on our exams and we would spend all of our time making sure we got good grades. We absolutely didn't even study for our exams and ended up throwing ourselves into what at first we thought was this silly simulation, but very quickly became a highly contentious political negotiation about the U.S. budget. So before the big shutdown of 95 and the big shutdown of 2011, should it come to pass, there was a shutdown of 89 right here at the Woodrow Wilson School. <laughs> and then Dean Don Stokes, uh, gave us a good talking to. Uh, he, uh, he didn't think that we were taking this seriously enough and that we had just run the, the government into the ground and we shouldn't be smiling about it. Well, I was the newly minted Senator Barbara Boxer in this uh, equation, and I'm happy to say that I did see her on Capitol Hill yesterday. Uh, she, she's no longer a newly minted Senator. 
Um, but the, the experience in this school of taking people from di diverse backgrounds and forcing us into this simulation that made us deal with politics, with very arcane budgetary rules, and uh, heaven help all of our poor international colleagues that were struggling to understand the United States, much less the U.S. budget. But we all came together and, and we had a very intensive experience. I have reflected on that many times as we've been going through this cycle right now. There are personal uh, qualities in people that are needed to get things in for a soft landing. There are political ideologies. There are all the things here that we experience that, that is going on out there. Um, but while Washington is churning, the world is truly burning right now. Um, it is uh, a litany of challenges. And if you read the headlines of the paper, they're just, they're swinging from one issue to the next, but it's all Libya today, all Japan, all fill in the blank. Uh, but all those other things are still going on, even if they've been pushed to the back pages or off the pages. We're at a time when, quite frankly, we should have 10 or 15 front pages of the newspaper. But the fact is, so many people in the world aren't reading newspapers at all anymore. This kind of information is flowing in totally new ways. And the generational divide is maybe never greater than uh, it is now. So if the pace of change and challenge is huge, uh, so is the challenge of pulling together the coalitions we will need to uh, bring this all in for a soft landing as we look at the different challenges. Um, the temptation to look inward is huge. And that's not just in this country, in the United States, but in every country we work with at the UN on a daily basis, the political instincts are saying, turn in, turn in, look out for our own. Times are tough, look out for our own. And of course, most policymakers know if you give in to that instinct, we're not going to come out the better for it. But all of the incentive structure is to try to turn in and at very least to reduce expectations. But inward and reducing expectations is exactly the opposite of where we need to go. So I want to talk tonight about how we could potentially move at this time and use a couple examples of a potentially new model for how we might uh, address some of these challenges. Um, it was striking to me yesterday, though, that on Capitol Hill, the number of senators and, and members of the House that I met with, they mentioned that they had been at a breakfast meeting with uh, an academic who had a, a book out. And I thought, oh, great, they're actually listening to academics on Capitol Hill. This is great. It was all about a book called The Frugal Superpower, which had had a, 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 a Michael Mandelbaum from SICE. Um, that um, uh, really had caught the imagination of a number of members of Congress. But what struck me was they were focused on the word frugal, not on the word superpower. We used to talk about in this school all the dimensions of what kind of superpower the U.S. should be, but now the focus on the word frugal is all the rage. Um, for this conference, you all will be focusing on dollars, diplomacy, and development. Um, I think of these three words. Um, many are prepared right now to put diplomacy and development on the back burner while we focus on dollars. Um, in fact, that instinct uh, is understandable, but we have to resist the urge, and we actually have to look at all three of the subjects you've chosen for this, and I think uh, very wisely so. So tonight I wanted to uh, address this potential new model that we've been, I will say, experimenting with in the last uh, four or five years at the UN, because it shows some, some potential in a, a different range of areas. While I'd been asked to talk about US foreign assistance and foreign policy, this is the ultimate multilateral moment. The burdens are too big for any single country. 
Globalization and its consequences have truly come home to roost in ways that mean interdependence is no longer an academic theory. It's being lived out in ways big and small. The political tectonic plates really are shifting in the world, and no one knows yet kind of what that means for how they relate to each other. And the burdens are so big that the term burden sharing is probably an understatement, the need for burden sharing. So this is the ultimate moment where the United States, if it is to be a global leader, has to uh, be able to work the multilateral system. And that's a, a second reason I'm very glad that I received the invitation to speak here tonight. Um, while I've worked for the US government and I've looked at things through a bilateral lens and through a unilateral lens in US government, um, I find that my experience at the UN uh, is matching this thinking. US government. But the needs of the multilateral huge right now. I'm going to start I want not just because it's a challenge, not just a human government. in subset. Are, are pretty um, dominant and, and driving a lot of things. Today, and who's going which way on that one road in Libya. But the fundamentals in the region are so much more uh, compelling if you allow yourself to think about them. Societies that have to create a huge number of jobs that don't have many or have few options right now to create those jobs. Expectations are higher than ever because information is freely available. The wiredness of some of the societies in the Middle East uh, defies most people's expectations. The fact that Egyptians are one of the most wired societies and cell phone penetration is in the 90 Five, 94% range. It makes it not a surprise that a lot happened uh, in Egypt on the, on the front end. We have to deal with these generational issues because it's not going to stop in two or three or four or five countries. I think this is where it gets quite sobering quite quickly. How much policy attention, how much money, how many people do we have to throw at these problems in a normal instance, we'd be putting everything we got on Egypt right now. But we also have Tunisia, we also have Libya, we also have Sudan, we also have Cote d'Ivoire, we also have Japan. And as you go down the list, we get very thin very fast. So we have to think in some broad structural terms to get at some of the big drivers. And the youth bulge, I think, is one of the most uh, profound and important that we have to deal with. But a second issue that I wanted to talk about tonight is where we start to get towards uh, a bit different model uh, about the way we do things. And that is the work that we've been doing on global health. About three years ago, the Secretary General and I had a conversation about what were the issues that we could make the biggest difference on. Whether or not we had anyone asking us to do it, whether or not we thought we had a, an answer or a plan, and we looked at two, climate change and global health. Because the structure of both problems, these are the ultimate public goods, global public goods. When I came to school, I had no idea what a public good was. So I did really learn something here beyond my simulation. And now I am working day to day on the provision of global public goods. 
The, I, I won't talk about climate change tonight, even though we spent a lot of time on this, and even though it is fundamental, it, it has receded into the background because of all of the current pressing needs. I would simply put a flag here that uh, if we think that the climate challenge has gone away just because we wish it away, um, uh, it certainly hasn't, and it is driving a lot of what will face us in the development uh, paradigm in the coming uh, period. But I want to focus on the global health piece and what we've done with it, because it's actually quite exciting. We sat down and decided that we needed to use the different parts of the UN system to their maximum potential. UNICEF, UNAIDS, UNFPA, World Health Organization. We thought, if we bring this expertise together, there's a lot of new money going into health, but it's going in skewed in different specific issues. It's all very stovepiped. You have different countries funding different things. There's no coherent, broad vision. And everyone is not definitely not working together. So we said, this is a challenge for the UN. This is a challenge for multilateralism. So I am no health policy expert, Uwe Reinhardt notwithstanding. I'm not a health policy expert, nor is the se Secretary General. But we set off on a path of bringing all the health policy experts together. Then we said, what would we need to do to overcome all of these stale old debates that have been going on for decades about how to address various health challenges? And we found very quickly that there was agreement across all the expert community that you had to get to women and to children that there was a target population out there, that if you got to women and to children, it would be kind of the golden thread that would get you to so many other pieces of the development equation. So if you were to target that. So we, and, and that in fact we were doing most poorly in the Millennium Development Goals, uh, for those of you who know what those are, eight major goals that were set out in 2000 by the world's leaders. The one that was doing the poorest when we started on this path was maternal health. We thought mothers dying is probably the single greatest negative effect on a family's prospects. And yet it was happening all over the globe and we weren't getting a handle on it. So we said, let's start with the hardest. Let's not go after the low hanging fruit. Let's go after the fruit that's way up at the top of the tree. We brought everyone together and then we said, who do we need if we're to do things differently? And we said, well, we'll need the governments, but not just the donors. We're going to need the governments in the host countries. What are they prepared to do? We will need the private sector, and not just pharmaceutical companies, but private sector entities that have distribution networks, whether it's Coca-Cola or you name it. We need the whole private sector. We need philanthropy, not just Bill and Melinda Gates, but philanthropists from all over the world philanthropists in their own countries, philanthropists in their own regions. We would need, in other words, and I'm sorry, in civil society, who is delivering the services for women and children all over the world. So we said, wow, this is a grand coalition we're going to need to be able to go after this. So we just started systematically building it and calling together the leaders of these different communities. And what was striking is we agreed over the course of a little over a year on a global strategy for women's and children's health. Age-old debates in the community, the expert community, were solved when everyone got in the room and we kind of hammered at it. And we leveraged one community against another to make sure that, that they called foul when people were just going into old orthodoxies. So we had this grand plan. And then we said, well, we're going to take it to the Millennium Development Goal Summit last September, where we would have leaders. The next part of the model being, you got to get over the expert community, you even have to get over all the, the stovepiped ministers and ministerial responsibilities in governments. You have to get to the leaders, and you need to get to the CEOs, and you need to put them in a room and have them not only commit to it, but then agree to a set of, of specific actions that would make it happen. Well, last September we had the most extraordinary event at the UN. We had a conference room that held about 400 people, not only full, but full of CEOs, heads of state, the top uh, people in their field, and we could not see all the heads of state that wanted to come into a room to talk about women's and children's health. 
And literally, the Secretary General and Prime Minister Wen Jiabao of China had to turn around and go back upstairs to the Secretary General's office to wait while all of the heads of state got seated. It was that full. What we've seen since then, and on that day last September, $40 billion, billion with a B, were committed to women's and children's health. And everyone talks about in the development game, double counting and old money and new money. We took the most stringent criteria we could find and counted up this money. And we wouldn't count it if it came from some other account that was dedicated to something else. We wouldn't count it. After we strained out everything that was at all questionable, we still had $40 billion in commitments on the table. And where did they come from? Did they come from the United States government? Yes. Did they come from the UK and from Norway and Germany and some of the big donors? Absolutely. Huge amounts of money coming from developing countries themselves who have come to the conclusion that they have to invest in their women and children and that there is a result to be gained, not just a economic result and a development result, but a political result. So we had the president of Nigeria dedicate a chunk of his oil money for the first time ever to paying for women's and children's health throughout Nigeria. But it wouldn't be enough if he said that. We needed to actually bring in the companies and the NGOs and all of the players that could put together the distribution system that would actually get this out into the hands of the people. We are going through a boom right now. That 40 billion is looking like a, uh, a very small beginning to compare to where I think we're headed. Why in this tough, tough, tough economic environment are we seeing such significant commitments and delivery on these commitments? Because we're getting results, they're quantifiable, we can see them, they have political payoff as well as economic payoff. And quite frankly, we have identified a set of issues with a human face, mothers and children. And it is something that uh, this grand coalition is not only hanging together, it's growing. And so literally this morning I had a meeting on this subject where again, we're bringing this grand coalition together and everyone's reaching back into their community. So we're building out this uh, kind of rapidly multiplying uh, coalition. It's exciting because it starts to get us to scale. When you're talking billions, that matters. When you're talking this range of actors that can deliver, it matters. And so while we were feeling overwhelmed when we started this three years ago, right now we're feeling quite empowered. And right now the word empowerment is not rolling off of people's lips very easily. So I think this is an exciting area that, that we need to uh, not just keep moving forward, but we need to think about um, for how to uh, address other issues. We're doing the same thing, by the way, in uh, access to energy around the world. Another meeting we had today was how to take this model, putting all the private sector actors, the governments, North and South, the international organizations, and the civil society together, to make sure that the 1.5 billion people with no access to modern energy services get that, but that at the same time, energy efficiency in countries like the United States could be improved by 40% by 2030. Um, having this kind of a big goals, but then a big coalition that has a game plan, agreed, and everyone starts to make commitments against it right away, it is it is absolutely exhilarating when people see who's sitting next to them that they've never sat next to before and that everyone's delivering and raising each other's game. Uh, and all of the old orthodoxies about donors and recipient countries, you don't even hear it in the room. You don't even hear it. Everybody's a donor. Everyone is giving what they have. And it's, it's a fascinating kind of psychological shift as well as an organizational shift. One other issue that I wanted to talk about tonight is one of the, the uh, subjects that, ha that has totally fallen off anybody's radar screen right now, except maybe ours. It is Sudan. There was a time not too long ago when Darfur was in the headlines, um, the longest running civil war, the north-south civil war in Sudan, 
was a big story. Now we can't find a journalist who will cover it. And yet the consequences of ensuring that this largest country in Africa, the southern part of which has just voted in an independent referendum, uh, 90 plus percent, 95 plus percent for independence, that this July will become the United Nations 193rd state perhaps one of the least prepared countries to become its own state that you can imagine. It does have oil, but there is absolutely no uh, institutional infrastructure to build on here. Um, how do we ensure that this new country and the old country it's leaving that are so crucial to an entire subregion and quite frankly to global dynamics relating to global security and global economy, how do we ensure this comes out right? Well, I think we do need to look at what is the grand coalition that is going to bring Sudan in for a soft landing, while all the attention is elsewhere. Here is where the United Nations is at its absolute best. You have to integrate the security dimension, the political dimension, the human rights dimension, the economic dimension, the social dimension. It's going to take all of this, and it is going to take a massive project at state building, especially in the South, but even in uh, the North, if we're able to reach a uh, peace settlement in Darfur, so that there could be two stable neighbors that could anchor East Africa and pushing towards that very unsettled North Africa, um, for years and decades to come. And here, I just wanted to give you a sense of the level of challenge we face in Sudan. We're talking about a country that in Darfur has lost 200,000 and had 3 million people displaced. But in the North-South War, over 20 years, 2 million lives lost and 4.5 million displaced. So the dislocation that we now have to put back together is huge. And in this situation, we have um, a country that is essentially being, um, the stability is being maintained by a UN force that is chewing up three-eighths of our entire global peacekeeping budget, a huge chunk of our global peacekeeping budget. At the same time, Illiteracy in Sudan, in southern Sudan, excuse me, is over 90 percent. Over 90 percent. And the salaries for the security forces and the civil service are consuming 80 percent of the annual $2 billion budget in southern Sudan. How do we make this a viable entity <coughs> to make sure that we don't end up giving birth to a failed state in a very bad region to have a big failed state? that could give rise to global terrorism, certainly give rise to regional instability. So the Sudan challenge is huge, and quite frankly, it's made for a place like the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, while I didn't study a lot about Sudan while I was here, a lot of the specific issues on our development side, on our IR side, and quite frankly, on our domestic policy side, uh, actually all the concentrations, we have those needs right now in a place like Sudan. But it's not USAID that's going to do this. It is going to be a collective global effort. The UN and the strength of multilateralism, kind of the new multilateralism, means that the tectonic shifts have to not just be accommodated, they actually have to be utilized. That is, China has to play its role in the Sudan, not just the United States. Um, Africa and countries bordering on Sudan have to play a role. We need to meld all the forces inside and outside Sudan around this huge, huge challenge. So if this new multilateralism is to succeed, we need to see what the grand coalition looks like on each of these major issues and get it to work. Um, what is exciting about being at the UN right now is that these problems are being laid at our feet. But it is going to require drawing upon all of these different elements to be able to make it work, and at the highest level, and have that level of political commitment. 
I think that the pace of change right now in the world is not going to slow down. The technological changes that are driving it, the global integration that is driving it, means that we're going to be working at a pace and living at a pace that none of us is used to. Uh, every time I go speak with the under 30 crowd, and especially if the under 20 crowd, it doesn't matter what country you are in, it does not matter what country you're in, they get their news from different places than we do, they communicate with each other different than we do, uh, it is a truly new generation. Instead of being kind of baffled by it all and afraid of it all, we have to embrace it and embrace it uh, wholeheartedly. And I think that's something that we're trying to do at the UN, getting real-time information in Haiti, in Libya, in Japan. We've been using communities that have been volunteer communities over Facebook and Twitter that we've actually pulled people out of the rubble in Haiti using SMS systems that bounce probably between three and four countries. We've been identifying what's happening in Libya, not through satellite imagery, not through news reports, but actually by people in the country who are SMSing and then sorting that data, uh, building networks along those lines. And in Japan as well, which has suffered such a devastating blow that we've even forgotten all the human toll in Japan while we focus on the nuclear question. So these kinds of organization are powerful, extremely powerful, and we have to harness them. Just one final observation about the United States' relationship to all this, as you all sit down to talk about diplomacy, development, and dollars uh, tomorrow. There's no doubt in my mind, and it's not just because I carry an American passport, that to make any of this work, we need a super motivated, absolutely uh, active United States to make this equation work. But it's also as essential for U.S. leadership that it do so now, because the multilateral uh, system is based on some old premises that come from a bygone era. And if we're going to see a multilateralism that can adapt to the 21st century, we need to lock that in now. We need that new compact for what the new multilateralism will look like. Just looking at some of the issues I have tonight, who's come together around global health, around Sudan, uh, around the Middle East and North Africa, and how we've come around uh, those issues, gives me some hope that there are coalitions out there. There is a multilateral system that could deliver on these things. But it is time that the United States makes increasing financial, political, and human capital investments in the multilateral system. The UN is not a building up in New York. The UN is hundreds of thousands of multilateral staff deployed in all the hardest places all around the globe. And so for those Americans in the crowd tonight, I beg you uh, to make your voices known, whether you've, you've known much about the UN or you've dealt with it at all, uh, this is the time where the United States has to really make that multilateral machinery work because you probably won't get another good chance. It will pass you by. And I think this is for an American working at the UN is uh, both an exciting time and a bit sobering. That the United States has to use the great capital it's earned over the last 50, 60 years uh, to make sure that this new system really takes shape. And so multilateralism is alive and well. It's a little uh, thinner and, and stretch, more stretched than uh, I think we'd like to see it right now. But we do have some answers, and if we, uh, if we really mobilize around it, I think we can match these challenges. Thank you. Can I be happy to do questions, comments. Uh, usually find that's the most interesting part of the discussion anyway, so <laughs> please, the floor is open.
And I think that's the area where I see the biggest problem for us, which is that currently we are very different focused. We are very much focused on dollars and not anything else. Um, and frankly, I think the public discussion is not even beginning to look at the multilateral system and the potential for it forward. So I'd like to hear some of your thoughts about how we change the societal vision that we have in this country to move in that direction. I think the, uh, the question of how to uh, engage the public, um, the citizens of the United States, in this kind of a vision, uh, I think it's built in a bit into this model I talked about, about bringing all those actors in. It is fascinating to me who you bring into the tent when you bring in the private sector. Who you bring into the tent when you bring in foundations. It's not just a few rich individuals, it's their whole networks. Who do you bring in when you bring in civil society? NGOs come in every stripe and color, but when you get an NGO that delivers all these goods and services in West Africa for you, they also have a donor base of hundreds of thousands of average Americans. So you're actually getting value on both sides of the equation. So when we built this mother, every woman, every child coalition, um, it is striking to me that it keeps growing in part because the base is so broad. It's not just that we're delivering to women and children out there, who we've mobilized in a country like the United States, or in Europe, or in Japan, uh, it is a, a broad base as well. And so I think the, the grand coalition and organizing these constituencies and having a multi-stakeholder approach helps with that, but it doesn't deliver it. You still need leadership. And, you know, it's something we had just rip-roaring debates here. And I, I look at Greg Stankiewicz and I remember we, during our, our class here, in this, in this auditorium having huge debates over should we be studying leadership at this school? You know, we're being too technocratic. Um, we were very serious-minded people in those days, right, Ann? Um, and we thought, oh, we're getting a very good technocratic education, but where does the leadership question? Uh, I think it is still the right question to ask. Leaders aren't just presidents and prime ministers. Um, leaders are at the head of different kinds of organizations. And it's to that level, the chief executive level, that we've been going to uh, kind of meet the, this push from the bottom. And I think that leadership equation, uh, one of the most exciting things about this model that I'm describing is that presidents do things differently when it's not just other presidents sitting across from the table. When you sprinkle some CEOs of civil society organizations and businesses um, in their midst, they talk differently. And I, I had an, a fascinating experience sitting next to a head of state in Africa who I'd been talking to for quite some time about this every woman, every child, and in his country has a huge problem with maternal mortality and child mortality. And you know, I just wasn't getting through, wasn't getting through, and then I turned to my other side and was talking with the CEO, and then I said, I'm just gonna take myself out of this. And I kind of backed my chair up and introduced them to each other, and then just watched as the president got more engaged. He was listening to this CEO. CEO was talking about investment decisions. You know, what would I need to invest in your country? I need da, da, da. And by the end of this discussion, the president was saying, you know, this every woman, every child thing. So like, if you come in and we do all this and we invest in this, then you would be happy to come invest in my country. And it was like, I was sitting there brokering a, an investment deal of two kinds, a social investment, as well as a private sector investment. And I think that kind of, um, we have to look at incentive structures. And incentive structures of average citizens uh, is also something we have to pay attention to. How do you get people to actually feel engaged to what they are seeing out there? In Haiti, we've been connecting literally citizens around the globe to average citizens in Haiti um, through technologies that we all have, and they all have. And it has created a, a more sustainable um, policy because there is actually a base that cares about Haiti now, whereas five years ago when we failed in Haiti, and 10 years ago, and 15 years ago, and 20 years ago, we couldn't get a sustainable grassroots support in this country for Haiti. We're doing much better on that now. Please. Just as you said that we are facing numerous problems today, don't you think that the whole world is overextended, not only in the case of debt, on the brink of poverty shutting down, and then the global debt of 
dollar, which is again overextension, or dollar reserves of China, another example of overextension, and then the basic problems of human beings in terms of health and maternal and children in Africa and other parts of the world. And then demographic overextension of largest number of people below the age of 30 in a very large south of the world. So given that, are we reaching a point where a country like the United States, let alone the United Nations, don't recognize that their resources of solving or addressing those problems are also not unlimited, they are limited. So is there a way to address, prioritize the problem, rather than addressing in a crisis management uh, frame of mind, and as a result, uh, everything is being addressed without being solved on a sustainable basis. Or we will just continue to do this way as we have done in the United States with regard to our deficit, which has grown to a size where even we might be a bankrupt country like a number of European countries. Mm. This, this issue of overextension is huge because there, there is, uh, there's a lot of facts to back it up. But there's also the issue of a mentality of overextension. Everyone feels overextended now. Until you go to a number of the emerging economies. During the financial crisis, we were starting to do this analysis about where, what, what the effect the financial crisis was having on the most vulnerable people in the world. So we went through the classic analysis and started looking at the least developed economies and the major developing economies and saying what's happened to the, the most marginalized people in these countries. And then when we started looking at the data and saying, no, wait, something's wrong here. These countries are actually doing better than Western Europe and the United States and Japan. And it was totally, we, we were fighting the data for quite some time, just saying, this isn't quite right. These guys can't be leading the recovery. That's not the way it works. Well, guess what? They are leading the recovery, and the mentality of overextension is not nearly as severe. They may have many problems in India, and many problems in China, and many problems in Brazil, but they are aggressively investing towards the future. Uh, the investment mentality in China and India and Brazil, forward-looking, while right now in the United States it's palpable, pull back, cut, you don't cut your way out of a, a deficit. You know, the crisis right now, yes, you have to make logical cuts in government spending, but you also have to grow. <laughs> and it, the, the growth mentality in the major developing economies right now is palpable, and the lack of a growth mentality in the United States and Europe and Japan is palpable. So this is part of the tectonic shift that I'm, I'm talking about is we really uh, are going to very rapidly see this shift accelerate if this continues. The developing countries, large developing countries, really aggressively investing and, and growing, and the old developed countries pulling back and trying to consolidate, consolidate, consolidate. There's a role for consolidation, and fiscal overextension is very real, uh, but it is striking how different the mentality in different parts of the world is right now. And I think that's something that in our policy making, uh, not many people have fully captured yet. When you're lucky enough to sit where I do, I work with the Chinese every day. I work with the Indians every day. I work with the Brazilians every day, the South Africans. They're looking at all this stuff very differently than if you're sitting on the East River in New York or if you're sitting on the Potomac River in Washington. Okay. I have to call him Richard Rowe or something. Does that then mean that uh, given the United States is uh, retrenching, if you will, on a fiscal, fiscal context, that the United States really can't play the leadership role in these courses that you have uh, just described? And given the attractive nature of our politics, again, something you've alluded to, and the nature of the debate that's taking place right now about how uh, our resources are to be deployed, Fiscal retrenchment, both in the United States and a lot of other developed countries, uh, most certainly affects this equation. But if we recall what percentage of our federal budget is going towards uh, development assistance, it's minute to the point of being rounding error. 
And so, uh, yes, we have to get a, a grip on entitlements and social security and all those issues that are, dom quote, domestic policy. Uh, but it does not mean that we cannot play the role internationally that we have traditionally played. And here I speak not as a UN official, but as an American. Um, people still look to the United States. And, and I find this is kind of part of my daily existence at the UN. Um, people kind of look at you and say, well, American citizen, we've got to be a little careful. They see things differently there, you know. And then all these crises come. Where do people look? Right here, <laughs> the United States. So the ability to play a leadership role is, uh, is definitely still there. When the U.S. goes in a certain direction, people really do pay attention and people do follow. But it does require being able to walk the walk. We have to be able to invest and put some money. On this Women and Children Initiative, uh, the United States um, uh, put a lot of money in. And at first we were very excited. And then we said, but wait, you're doing this all bilaterally? You know, you really need to leverage that money. Let's, let's see if you can look at some of the other vehicles you have. And what was fascinating is that the dialogue with the United States um, uh, started much more to parallel the dialogue with the rest of the, the partners that we had. And when the United States saw how much investment Nigeria and Indonesia and India were making in this, it enabled them to do a lot more as well. So I think that the logic of overextension and the feeling of, of being spread too thin is something we have to fight against because, it, especially for the United States, uh, the stakes are so high that if the U.S. looks like it's pulling back, if anyone has a whiff that the U.S. is pulling back, it will have real world consequences in markets, in political markets, and in psychological markets. That everyone starts to get in a little bit of, wow, this is overwhelming, we can't do this. So I don't think the United States has the luxury to kind of pull back, um, both for its own good, but also for the good of the world. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's way premature to say that, you know, the United States was the power of the 20th century. The United States is absolutely essential to the 21st century, but the United States has to act like it. Before we leave, let me, let me give you a few uh, uh, comments on the plan for tomorrow. Uh, breakfast is served at 8 a.m. here. Around 8.15, if people want to bring their breakfast into this room, I will be happy. Uh, I will be here, and a group of MPA students will be here, and we will, uh, I'll, I'll give a brief overview of what's going on in the school, answer your questions. One of the advantages of coming for this, so I'll give you, is many more people will come tomorrow. And we have overflow bowls downstairs. So one of the advantages of coming for the alumni breakfast is that you get to like stake out a seat. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing that I want to tell you is wear your name tags, because uh, uh, for some of the events, um, we will make sure that alumni get into this room as opposed to going downstairs to the overflow bowls. So please join me again and thank you for the Yeah.